Welcome back to another episode of My Corner of the Universe. Today, we interviewed Morgan Beershink from Geoship. Geoship is a completely revolutionary, eco-friendly, carbon-negative way of basically taking the whole housing world and flipping it upside down into this geometric ball-looking shape thing. Super awesome. I mean, for those of you listening to this episode, I go into it like just thinking like, man, what would life be like if we built houses and live just a little bit differently and go with that open mind? And I think you'll be really entertained by the conversation. Yeah. And thinking outside the box, no pun intended for housing is definitely, um, you know, something that we should do, especially we were talking about in disaster areas, fire prone areas, hurricane, earthquake prone. This can be a great solution for people that have been devastated by those they could rebuild at this for less cost than a normal house and you could be potentially setting yourself up to not be affected by those future uh natural disasters so i i really think what he's doing is cool and i like how he's the business model he's choosing to do it in through kind of your you buy equity into the company when you're purchasing something um i think that's a a great way to uh you know, build communities moving forward in this weird time we live in. Yeah, definitely weird time we live in. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, it really is just such a cool concept. I mean, you're talking like really fire resilient, wind resilient. Um, I, I didn't catch exactly what he said, but part of the interview, he mentioned how the different uh, panels or a, could be electro controlled. So like you could, you could dim light on some of them open light on other ones. I mean, it's just, you you gotta, you should almost actually, you should, you should probably, when you're listening to this, pull up your phone and go to geoship.is or look them up geoship on Instagram. So you can see some pictures of this and then listen to the podcast interview. Cause then you'll at least have a vision in your mind of what he's talking about. Um, But just super cool, man. I mean, and the cool thing is too, is it's like, they're not even really making these yet so this is the early phase of the concept and you know if it catches on this is one of those episodes that we could look back in three or four years and be like man i can't believe we talked to them when this was just you know not an idea they're way past the point of an idea but they are like still very very in their infancy of their company yeah they've got their seed funding they've got some prototypes that he said it sounds like we'll be out this fall um and I'm excited. This is definitely one where I'm excited to circle back with them in a year or two and, and see where things are at um, and look forward to seeing a geo ship in person as well. So yeah. um, if you're interested in architecture or alternative building or just thinking outside the box, this is a great episode. Make sure that you're sharing it and liking the episode and we'll see you on the next episode. Enjoy it. All right, welcome back to My Corner Universe. Today, we have the pleasure of interviewing Morgan Beershank from Geoship. Welcome to the show, Morgan. Hey, thank you. Yeah, so um, I found out about uh, Geoship through Facebook, one of those uh, articles is scrolling down, and I was like, wow, this looks interesting. Um, I got introduced to the concept of earth ships quite a while ago and was always intrigued about the whole earth ship idea. Not necessarily that this has anything to do with that, but when I saw a geo ship, it kind of like, Oh, this is cool. Um, and then I, you know, read the article that I saw. I don't know if it was, was it Forbes that you guys were written up in or um, I'm sure you guys have had lots of different press. There's, there's been a few Forbes and yeah, fast company and cool. Um, and so you guys, are you guys still in the process of doing uh, crowdfunding or where are you guys at as far as the company goes? Uh, we just closed our seed round, which was raised through a start engine, which is equity based crowdfunding. Okay. So we had like 1600 investors and raised a million dollars through, through the crowd. And then also some um, 
another million dollars through like future customers, a couple of future customers. Cool. So we're just uh, basically finishing product development now and planning another fundraise next year. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about what GeoShip is for people that are listening to this and they have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Um, where the concepts start, you know, what is GeoShip and, and kind of where do you see it going in the future? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the name is a, like a pseudonym for the earth. Um, and kind of based on Buckminster Fuller's view of like, you know, the earth as a spaceship. So we are like consciously sailing this, you know, spaceship through uh, time and space. And he kind of, um, he described humans as like the sensing apparatus on the spaceship, you know, that we really could like see where things are out of um, harmony and make adjustments to really, uh, regenerate our ecosystems and biological systems and sociological systems too. So I think, um, you know, our, our core mission really is around regeneration of ecologically, biologically, and socially, sociologically. Uh, so we're forming a multi-stakeholder cooperative. We're using a new material science to um, precast all ceramic homes. And we're starting with the a set of geodesic domes that connect to one another. It was Buckminster Fuller the, the first one that kind of came up with the geodesic home type of structure or? Kind of, I mean, Plato actually defined, you know, the geodesic sphere 2,500 years ago and called it uh, Gaia. Though like, he also called it like a container for becoming. Uh, is basically all five of the platonic solids kind of nest within this uh, right. geodesic sphere so that their corners touch its corners. Um, so he kind of, you know, there was the, the geometry, but Buckminster Fuller really uh, defined a new math, synergetic math, so that we could build geodesic domes. Um, and, and he built the first, some of the first domes. There's actually maybe before Bucky, there's maybe one geodesic planetarium kind of thing that was built by i forget the guy's name but gotcha and really so you had that. that idea to kind of take that same geometric shape and approve upon it with the materials that you guys are working with yeah so i mean you know the geodesic dome is it's like the lightest strongest most efficient means of enclosing space known to man it's like the the capsid, the protective protein shells that are around viruses are geodesic. Right. The earth grid, actually, like the ley lines, that the rivers of magnetism, in a sense, that surround the earth that form a geodesic grid. And even they say that there's a good theory out there by reading by some surfer that was posted in Nature magazine around the whole universe is a, a geodesic because basically it's a icosahedron and dodecahedron uh, 3D golden ratio fractal. It's like the only 3D golden ratio fractal. So Buckminster Fuller would do like, he'd put this dodecahedron in his hand and, and squeeze it and say, oh, it's an icosahedrocasa, icosa. And that pump is what's happening in the, the universe. So, you know, it's like add within, so without, I mean, yeah, there's a, it's really efficient form. And then also Buckminster Fuller said, you know, he predicted it would be 50 to 100 years until the material sciences really arrived to mass produce geodesic domes. And pretty much, you know, like in the early 2000s, there was a, a long R&D project at some of the national labs where they developed the basic compositions and theory of chemically bonded ceramics. And now we're applying that new material science to build all ceramic combs. Okay, so is it ceramic and concrete kind of mixed or what's the material? Yeah, it's um, it's really a new family of materials. They're, they're inorganic polymers. So they're um, they kind of, like if you imagine today we have like, con like cement, ceramics and epoxies, right? Like three kind of material families. This kind of sits right in the middle of those and that it's like ceramics and that there's covalent and ionic bonding and it's highly crystalline and high strength, but it's like cement in that it's a powder that's water activated, doesn't require high heat. 
and it's like a epoxy in that it forms molecular bonds with itself and with wood and with metal. It's like a glue. Oh. So that kind of com new combination of material properties really uh, enables us to precast panels that are then mortared together on site with the same material that the panel is made out of. Mm -hmm. And the coefficient of thermal expansion is really low and the shear bond strength is really high. So basically enables really uh, strong, long-lived um, ceramic structures that are cast in panels and then basically become monolithic when they're put together on mm -hmm. site. And so what's, what would be the advantage of this ceramic material versus a traditional like steel or something like that, you know, and how come steel or, or any other material wouldn't really work that great for, for the, these, these structures? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, with, with geodesic domes, like, you know, the, the kind of ways that they built them in the past were one, just like wood frames, you mm -hmm. know, just like basically the same way that they build a stick frame house, except it's a geodesic. And in that case, it's really hard to, uh, to get them to not leak, you know, because you're, you have this big, so many scenes. there's no differentiation between yeah. the walls and the roof, you know, it's kind of like right. in trying to get square shingles to go over a whole round roof is tough. And there's also a lot of waste because you're cutting these irregular triangles out of, uh, you know, four by eight stock. And then there's a lot of seams that have to be dealt with. So the wood, wood approach didn't work too well. And, and also the, the concrete approach was really like, uh, um, you kind of end up with something that looks like a concrete bomb shelter. Mm -hmm. And there's still the, there's a lot of expansion and contraction with concrete, you know, the coefficient right. of thermal expansion is big. So, you know, one part of the uh, dome gets hot and it expands and causes a crack somewhere. And, and uh, so the concrete approach didn't work too well either. And then metal, the other approach is like a metal frame with a plastic skin that's kind of pulled over. That's like great an observatory kind of or something like yeah a lot of event domes are like that okay. and uh there's a nice little backyard kind of glamping kind of style domes that are like that but it's not a permanent long-lived structure it's you know maybe got five or ten or twenty year life and there's a lot of uh plastic and you can't insulate them really well and so yeah, what so is, this the, is just the life uh span of, of this material then uh, that we're aiming for like a 500 year life. Whoa. So, so that's completely different than our traditional house that maybe is, you know, got a hundred, 150 years in it. Um, so that, wow, that's, that's a huge selling point right there. Yeah. And you know, one of the, like I mentioned, the material was developed at the national labs and they were developed it to solidify and store nuclear waste. Right. So they did a lot of, it's a really, uh, can re resist a lot of chemical attacks and um, just, you know, it's been tested in like NASA salt spray chambers and stuff to really see how, how well it holds up over time, even though it's a relatively new material. And actually the ancient structures, like, you know, the pyramids and Great Wall of China and whatnot, the, the ancients were using some of these similar magnesium based um, ceramic materials to build build temples you know, oh. back in the day uh, uh, you had and mentioned then also you know, one of the things also with uh you know having a, a a life of that long also means you have to have ways to uh to repair and resurface it easily and that's one of the benefits of this material science is like if a you know bullet went through the wall or a tree fell on or whatever some kind of damage you can actually just mix a ceramic up in a bucket on site and pack wow, it and it's cool. like a waterproof permanent repair or spray it with the ceramic like a paint and resurface the whole thing so those properties make it so that you know you can restore and uh, extend the life indefinitely that's cool i was curious you mentioned about insulation um how how are they insulated and what is like you know, any sort of heating cooling system for, for the, sh the structures? Yeah, so the, the you know, it, think of, we're, it's basically a, a flat pack that arrives on site. So you have a bunch of parts 
and the parts are basically frame members, you know, like little pieces that are about three or four foot long, and those all lock together with a uh, hub members, and that's all ceramic. So you have a ceramic frame that's put up, and then you have ceramic panels that fit on the outside of the frame and the inside of the paint frame, and the, ins the cavity is filled with the cellular ceramic insulation. So it's a, we entrain the ceramic with air to give it like an, a really good insulative property. Almost like a vacuum seal kind of, of like a canteen, but more high tech um, than that. <laughs> vacuum sealing would be awesome. You know, I think in longer term, we'll be able to figure that out. But in the shorter term, it's just, a, um, it's a ceramic that's basically, we use a, a foam, an aqueous foam that gets it's like a soap bubble, basically an engineered soap bubble that gets mixed with the ceramic so that it's a uh, cellular and about, you know, five pounds per cubic foot or something. That's gotcha. pretty, pretty light. So you would do an outside panel at that point, would you run your wiring and then put the inside panel and, you know, do the insulation? Yep. Okay. Just like they do a normal, you know, frame outside wiring, plumbing, inside insulation. Kind of process. Cool. How, and then I, are they generally like sold as, or like modeled as the, like one bedrooms or do you see them being larger structures? Yeah. I mean, our first, uh, first product is a 16 foot dome. So it's small, you know, small, but you can connect multiple of them to one another. Right. So you can easily uh, make it into a bigger space like, domes into a bigger space and then next year and the year after we're, we'll have a it's kind of bigger domes that will also connect to the smaller domes ultimately there's basically a set of three size domes 16 foot 27 foot and 36 foot diameter that all connect to one another and then the bigger ones there's room for a loft like a second story uh, oh cool unit. when these are um done I'd imagine they're sealed up pretty tight. Do you guys have to do something with like makeup air to be able to, uh, you know, allow for proper draft or what does that look like? Yeah, there's just um, basically vents on the bottom and a vent at the top. So you get this kind of convection pattern okay. that happens. All right. And then also the, the building envelope is designed to breathe, right? So there's not uh, vapor barriers, but it just, it's one of the really interesting properties of this ceramic is actually like the Chinese did like the one of the biggest restoration projects in world history where they restored all their ancient temples. And one of the things they wanted to figure out was like, what were those materials that were used because they can't really use like epoxy and Portland cement to and fiberglass to restore an ancient temple. So they found a lot, a lot of like uh, logs that had been coated with these ceramic slurries. And the log, you know, it's like 1500 years old or 2000 years old and they're still, the wood inside is still preserved because basically what happens is that ceramic um, bonds to the wood and there's a charge differential. So the ceramic is basically paramagnetic and the wood is diamagnetic. So it actually draws the, turns water into vapor and draws it out. So it allows the, it's a, it Cures allows it. vapor to pass yeah. through it's waterproof. Kind of like Cortex or something, right? Crazy. Um, when you're building these, is this something where you're going to have to require them to be installed by like one of your technicians, or is it something where someone would order it and then they'd put together themselves? Or um, either way, okay. and kind of our, our main, um, you know, village building. We're really focused on like a village building platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, what that means is like eventually like next year people will be able to go onto our website and say I want to build a village and you gather your people together who you want to live with or you make a declaration right and there's a community of people that are looking for a, people to live with and uh, and then you can essentially step into like a, a village configurator so almost like a, a virtual reality environment where you can design the village that you want to build together and really have a really clear vision of what you're going to create together. And then we can work with the community to go through the whole design build process from like financing to acquiring land to like the permaculture process and 
and then really the like uh, place making, which is really like throw a part, throw a work party mm-hmm. and build yeah. the village, almost like a burning man, but it stays <laughs> for 500 years and it takes a little longer to build. Yeah, I know with like uh, cob buildings, a lot of times that's the way people would do it. They just get their community together and they'd go build their cob house and it would, you know, they'd knock it out much faster than someone trying to do it by themselves. Uh, I, I yeah. think right now in the climate that we're in, I think you have a lot of people that are rethinking, uh, you know, ways of living and communing together like we haven't seen in a long time. So I think that you're, business model is coming at a perfect time because people are wanting to get out of the cities. People are wanting to reevaluate what's important in their life. Like you said, permaculture, ways to be able to create food forests around them to where they're not as dependent uh, upon, you know, the services that we all are currently, whether that's grocery stores or uh, restaurants and um, I, I really s- like your vision of kind of encapsulating it all together to help people find the land, build the community. I think that's a great concept that you're putting together. Yeah, and I think the you know the domes have always been sort of a counterculture, you know, contrarian sort of thing. You know, they, an interesting uh, little case study is like the the dome community in uh, UC Berkeley that's been there since the '60s. And they're like, you know, you see, I always think this video of this this guy in this the dome community, right? And he's like standing on his uh, front porch in his underwear, drinking his coffee, and he's like, things are different here. We make our own rules, and uh, you know, the, what people think doesn't really apply. And <laughs> that's beautiful, you know. That's what we want to provide tools for people to make their own rules and their own communities and do, you know experiment yeah. with new ways to live in harmony with one another and with nature yeah, yeah that's just awesome. what are uh, just so people kind of get an idea what costs have you guys put costs at all to the bigger structures either and just what are, what kind of costs are people thinking about for these and then secondly would these technically qualify as a um, permanent structure like let's say you wanted to you had a piece of land and you wanted to put some what put a, a geo ship on there um, is this something that, cause you know, once something's permanent, you have to get extra fees and permits from the city, or is it technically a temporary structure that you could kind of breeze through some of those fees? Um, it, it would be considered a permanent structure. You could breeze through some of the things if you, you know, like a lot of, uh, counties have, if it's under 200 square feet, you know, you don't need a building permit. Um, so it, we have one dome that's just under 200 square feet. So you could kind of breeze through that way potentially, but really we're focused on like, it's a permanent structure and it will meet the international residential building codes. So it really should be permitted um, pretty much anywhere. I, the main areas where it won't be potentially not permitted is like in an existing neighborhood that has certain covenants that say, you know, the homes need to look a certain way. Mm-hmm. But generally, you know, in the rural areas for sure permitted um, and the price point, uh, this is really like a, a production technology. So like as we, you know, develop the technology and scale, the, the pr- potentially the prices come like way, um, way down to yeah. make it uh, really like a new affordability curve in a sense. But where, where it starts like in the next couple of years here, few years is about maybe 10% less than a conventional wood structure. Yes. Yeah. So cool. before we jumped on, we were kind of talking. I'm sorry, just, just to add to that, 10% less than a conventional wood structure per square foot, but you can build smaller, you know, build small efficiently uh, and also save money by doing some of the work yourself. The uh, insulation or the interior uh, systems can, there's a lot of potential cost savings in that. On that side. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, you kind of reminded me of another question there, but uh, before we jumped on, we were talking about fires, you know, we're in California here and forest fires are a big issue. Um, do these are, are, I would imagine are more impervious to fire than, uh, you know, traditional wood home or even right now, I know there's a hurricane going on. So, I mean, like talk about natural disasters. Is this a, a better solution than our traditional house? Yeah. Yeah, really, that's like one of the big, 
like the two big, three big areas that are kind of the value proposition is like one resilience to the embodied energy. So actually like potentially zero carbon or actually carbon negative, like actually sequester more CO2 than was used to, to make the materials and do the installation. Okay, uh, cool. And from a, on the resiliency side, it's like, yeah, fire is highly fire resilient because the same material science is used as a refractory ceramic, like in furnaces and stuff. I mean, you know, very resistant to high heats. Um, and also there's nothing to rot. So there's no, there's no organic material to, for mold to grow on. So uh, if, a, if there, like a flood kind of situation happened, it basically just dries back out and there's nowhere, nothing for mold to grow on. Um, and also the, the geodesic structure is like, there's no, um, they call moment connections, like where a column and a beam meet is what fails in like an earthquake, right? So there's none of those. So high, it's like the most earthquake resistant structure you can really build is like a, a monolithic dome like this. Uh, and finally the um, hurricane, you know, highly hurricane resistant because there's no big flat walls that, you know, build a lot of uh, wind force. It's a roundish structure, like triangulated. So. Yeah, that seems like if you're in an area that is prone to any of those natural disasters, then I mean, it seems like a, a great alternative, especially, you know, some people that have maybe lost their home and they're thinking about Charlie rebuilding in that same area, yeah. that might be a great well, alternative. Rex, I've been talking to you about we should just go move to Puerto Rico. Yeah. And you're like, well, I don't know, hurricanes scare me. I'm like, dude, this is the solution right here. <laughs> this is the solution. <laughs> right? We just get some land and put some of these up and then we're hurricane uh, resilient. And flood yeah. too, you know. We just need to, we just need a, uh, you know, solar generators. Yeah. How do solar? Do you have you uh, concepted the solar on these yet? Um, yeah. I mean, solar. You know, we think in a short, relatively short time horizon. It was five years or ten years or twenty years, but eventually there's more advanced power generation technologies. Like there's even a right now there's a a company called Earth Engine that is doing magnetic propulsion, like basically big magnets that, that just continually spin yeah. and generate power that way. And there's also, there's a crystal energy cells. So they're actually using the same type of ceramic material. And I, I mentioned before the paramagnetic diamagnetic thing. Well, what they can actually, they put like a coil of graphene through a ceramic uh, block that has alternating layers of paramagnetic diamagnetic and it is actually generating uh, energy like a, a capacitor. Wow, so like all, zero ultimately, point you know, those yeah. are the kind of technologies that are really going to be, you know, in a geodesic village that's gonna exist in 20 or 50 or 100 years, right? And the solar technologies I think are, um, right now if you, if, to build solar technologies into a dome, we wouldn't really wanna put the solar panels like on the dome. You could do little, you know, soft, like, um, I forget the name of the solar panels are kind of soft and could be integrated into the panels, but it's better to just do a solar array that mm -hmm. is off to the side that uh, feeds the village or little community. That makes sense. Uh, the other question, um, all of our current building uh, supplies are, are set for our standard models. So do you guys have to adapt, like let's take appliances, for example, like how do appliances go and fit in a geodesic dome like this? Um, appliances will, you know, sinks and uh, dishwashers and stoves would all fit in, you know, normally. Okay. Uh, like countertops would have to be, probably you're not gonna be able to go to Home Depot and get countertops, but that's part of what we, you know, will offer as the, you know, part of the product ecosystem is basically like doors and countertops and cabinets. And, and we kind of, one of the, from like a social regeneration perspective, uh, one of our, our business model, like we're organizing GeoShip as a multi-stakeholder cooperative. So that means that traditionally it's like, you know, investors own companies and then stock option world came in in the 60s and then that's like the employees and the investors own the companies, customers and nature 
will be owners in corporations too. And that's really the multi-stakeholder cooperative is essentially we will, uh, our customers and nature will have ownership in the company and um, the board of directors is basically a trustees. So people who have a legal responsibility to make decisions that are in the best interest of their stakeholder group, which may be the investors, or it may be the employees, or it may be the customers, or it may be nature. And actually we're working with like the Maori tribe in New Zealand on, um, they're kind of leading the like personhood for nature movement. Mm -hmm. So actually getting like legal status for uh, sacred mountains and rivers that become recognized as like, kind of like an orphan basically in the court system. And then they have trustees, you know, indigenous earth activists who are there trustees that are responsible for making decisions that are in the best interest of nature. So we can have, you know, nature be an owner in the corporations that we build as well as the customers. And uh, wow, that's a quite the concept. I've never even thought about something like that. Very cool. Yeah, it's exciting from like, you know, just a new way to do capitalism. That's why, you know, when people talk about like needing more government regulation and stuff to deal with climate change, it's like actually you know, and now that we can code our own currencies and develop new forms of capitalism, we can mm. we can handle this without having to rely on the yeah on cut the, the government extra. out. Yeah, Love I had it. a question about the structure too. I was thinking about is um, what's the foundation you usually put it on? Does it usually go on a cement foundation? Could you put it on a hard packed dirt foundation? Do you do post and pier? And then is the flooring the uh, the actual structure the same as the walls? Um, yeah, so you can basically, all of those foundations yeah. are possible. Um, the kind of bread and butter foundation that we'll, that we do is like a helical piers. So they're the base blocks of the dome are designed for these piers to go into them that kind of like screws that attach to the ground, which mm-hmm. gives you it's better for earthquakes. And there's also the domes could also be built on hillsides and stuff really efficiently and even like, you know, half covered in, in dirt. So it's kind of built into a hill. All those kind of applications are really uh, wow. fit well with the geodesic and also like piers, you know, like a platform uh, home. But we like the more like earthing floors, right? Like, so like cob floors or like the same ceramic panels that we use for the dome could be used for the floors Mm -hmm. so that you actually are earthed when you're in the home. That's kind of one of the, from like a biological regeneration perspective, this is the area of like, you know, 100% non-toxic building envelopes. So we're moving all the uh, potentially toxic chemicals and stuff that are in a lot of building materials today and then also getting this nice convection airflow patterns happening and light coming from all angles with electrochromic glass so you can control the heat and glare independently. And then uh, finally, earthing floors. So you have a, you know, your, an energy flow happening between your body and the earth, which is how we evolved for, so just thinking about like how did, what was it like to just be human on this earth like uh, you know 500 years ago or a thousand right. years ago mm-hmm. and just kind of recreate those conditions you know so how can we do, it's almost like like living in a stone circle right like imagine sitting in a stone circle in a meadow somewhere and what are the uh the you know environmental conditions here it's like there's light coming from all angles we're connected to the earth there's no toxic chemicals around us there's nice airflow happening that's what we want to recreate love it um is there a demonstration site currently are you guys working on that or what does that look like yeah we're working on it we're basically um we're in development right now so we've only done like uh engineering prototypes nothing that we've had customers like walk through it really took like like none of our you know myself or none of our other founders had any kind of uh, independent wealth, right? So we had to to really develop the the product and market virtually, and be able to get enough uh, people on board to help us help us build it. And that's where we're at now. Awesome! I love it. I can't wait to uh, come check it out in person. Um, and you guys are located in California. Is this something that you guys 
uh, envision being able to, you know, ship nationwide or is it going to be localized at first? What does that envision look like for you? Um, we'll have uh, essentially a beta program that like the first hundred domes will be kind of selective and, um, and a, a good sampling of around the US and a few international locations. But the vision is really for uh, local production um, in many different areas and including internationally. So all around the US and internationally and starting here in California. Right. Nice. Is that something that you guys envision? I mean, this might be more of just like a business strategy question, but actually expanding your company all over or kind of franchising it out so other people could use the the technology and, and start, you know, somebody who's in Minnesota, they're like, hey, we have, I think there's a market here and I want to, you know, be a, you know, a flagship, you know, carrier for you or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. A good um, model that we're pulling from a bit in that, it's not exactly a franchise. It's more like a cooperative, like the Mondragon Cooperative in this Basque region of Spain, right? It's like there's a bunch of companies that all kind of have ownership in one another. And, and that's what we're, you know, so we would like the people in Minnesota, if there's a market in Minnesota and some entrepreneurs that are ready to, they're passionate about building this, we would collaborate with them to, you know, maybe they provide part of the funding and we provide part of the funding and we could do like the product, uh, you know, to help with it or manage the technology development and the marketing and the local organization would manage like production and installations. So that's kind of like, it's kind of a hybrid between a, uh, a franchise and a, it's not, you know, franchising is kind of old school. Yeah, I got better. you. Cool. Yeah, I like cool. uh, thinking outside the box on a lot of things. And uh, I think a lot of people are afraid to do that. So even thinking outside the box on the structure of the buildings. Yeah, exactly. You know thinking outside the box. <laughs> um, I, I, I love what you guys are doing and I'm excited to see where your guys' company goes. Uh, do you have any final questions for him, Vaden? Uh, I don't. This has been super enlightening. I just want everyone to be able to uh, learn more and check out more. I think hopefully it piques a lot of people's interest into building not just not just structures differently but just like what Morgan's saying is communities you know and life different and living different and like you said also Rex you know now is an important time for that where a lot of people are maybe kind of reconfiguring like hey my you know four thousand dollar rent for my studio in San Francisco might not be the best way I should be living my life and maybe I should think about other options. So yeah. the website though Morgan if I'm wrong is www.geoship.is Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So wanted to put that out be, there. Uh, right now, the website is more just kind of a, a land, you know, one page, and there's not a lot of product information. And like in November, we'll have a completely new website with a lot more product information and uh, first dome installs happening also in the November. Oh, nice. Wow. Well, it does. It does right now. I mean, even when I was looking at it just a second ago, it does have some models and some floor. You know, some things that gives you some good information but yeah i'm super excited to see the new website come out to be able to to kind of play around with it more to see the, the possibilities with it one question before we let you go to morgan what is uh the typical install time on one of these that you guys are envisioning is it going to be faster than a traditional home or yeah super fast like a 16 foot structure two guys would be able to put it together in a day or two Wow. Oh, wow. So, so, and the bigger structure is also very fast. It's like putting together a piece of Ikea furniture or something, right? And <laughs> like, if you've done one of these chair, these Ikea chairs multiple times, like the third one's really fast. And so yeah, you just got to have better fast. instructions than Ikea, man. Their instructions yeah. are the worst. Yeah. Well, this is where <laughs> the, the augmented reality comes in beautifully too, because we'll, we'll provide augmented reality glasses with the ins for the installs and people can put Whoa, these glasses on and wow. like light up the panels and show them how they or have a helper that's in the glass awesome. pointing and explaining yeah wow that's like star yeah. trek that's even really cool i would even imagine like i would be super stoked to learn that like if even i was if i did, hadn't purchased yet but i was just interested because i'm sure a big holdup is going to be like wait, I could install this myself, but I don't really know if I can, but if I could go and like watch partial of some augmented reality courses on how to do it, I think that would be a, something that would 
be close to sealing the deal for someone who's like, okay, I, I can definitely do this, you know, after watching this video. Mm -hmm. Very yeah, cool. I've never even thought about that concept for uh, augmented reality. Wow. Great stuff, man. I really appreciate your time and um, we'll make sure to put the website in the show notes and um, look forward to connecting with you in the future. Once you guys, uh, you know, get some uh, prototypes out there and circle back with you for sure. Okay. Awesome. Thanks yeah. guys. Thanks, I appreciate Mark. the time. Yeah.